Uh, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly UCSF orthopedic surgery grand rounds. Um, today, we have one of our faculty meetings, uh, Dr. Alekos Theologis, uh, who will be um, giving us a talk. And for an introduction, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bourbon. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Drew, and thank you, Alekos, for being our grand round speaker today. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my, my partner and colleague, Alekos Theologis. Alekos is, is from the Bay Area and went to Stanford University as an undergraduate, um, came on to medical school at UCSF, and, and uh, he's, he's been what we call preparation UCSF since then, as he's gone on uh, from medical school to his residency, did a terrific job as a resident to UCSF, went on to Washington University uh, for his spine fellowship with, uh, with Keith Bridwell at the time, and then uh, we were fortunate to recruit uh, Lekos uh, with, with significant competition from other places uh, for Lekos to come back and be part of our faculty. Uh, Alekos is in his fourth year now uh, on our faculty, and he's really done a terrific job in building our spine tumor service, as well as improving access to care for our spine patients uh, by uh, being the spine surgeon at our outreach hospital uh, in, in the uh, uh, Berkeley uh, Orthopedic Group. Um, Alekos is uh, absolutely a, a phenomenal surgeon and clinician. He's a compassionate care provider, and he gives terrific access to patients uh, with significant and, and uh, um, um, uh, severe pathologies, including tumors affecting the spine, uh, deformity, and, and uh, in many cases, uh, underserved populations. Alekos has also been a, a very productive researcher in our group. Uh, Alekos has uh, taken over for me as the lead of our AO Spine Knowledge Forum, which is an international multidisciplinary uh, group of, uh, of surgeons. Uh, where uh, We've done quite a few peer-reviewed uh, funded uh, research projects. Alekos' work has included award-winning papers on topics including spinal deformity, uh, pediatric deformity, and trauma. And both as a resident and as an attending, Alekos has been ter ter terrifically productive in uh, his clinical and now starting uh, some work with biomechanics as well. So Alekos, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for uh, improving our spine tumor service and for leading uh, the initiative and on today's Grand Rounds, talking about surgery for spine metastases, the past, present, and future. Thanks, Lekos. Thank you, Dr. Bourbon. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak today on surgery for spinal metastases, past, present, and future. I'd also like to send a special thanks to uh, Dr. Wustrak, Zimmel, and O'Donnell. Um, as you'll see in the upcoming slides, taking care of spine um, or tumor patients requires a multidisciplinary effort, and they have been fantastic uh, colleagues to collaborate with, and I look forward to working with them closely um, in the near future and, and long term. So these are my current disclosures. The only ones that are relevant are the two last ones on the consulting, Carbofix and Icotech. Um, they are um, companies that design and create um, carbon fiber uh, pedicle screws, and I'm consulting for both of them. So as way of background, spine tumors come in two major flavors. One is extradural, as you see on the left. Second is intradural. The intradural category can be subdivided into extramedullary, so tumors that are outside of the parenchyma of the spinal cord, but within the dura, and then those that are intramedullary, which are within the spinal, um, within the spinal cord. When we see any intradural pathology, um, some examples as shown here, um, cervical menin meningiomas, um, anything that involves cutting the spinal cord with a knife, that is a direct referral to neurosurgery. So for this talk, um, we're going to be focused on extradural tumors. Um, and within that category, there's primary tumors and metastatic. We're going to be talking um, about metastatic tumors, and the goals of this talk are to discuss mainly the indications for surgery, general principles of resection, talk about reconstructive options, um, including some of the newer technology that I think is exciting and does hold a very uh, promising future in this space. But we will not cover our broad differentials based on imaging findings, et cetera, and we won't cover primary tumors, which are which is a, a grand rounds of, of in itself. Um, thousand foot overview in terms of metastatic spine disease. Um, it's the skeletal system is the third most common site of metastatic disease after the lungs and liver. 
70% of patients um, who die of cancer have spinal mets on autopsy and uh, approximately 15% have clinically symptomatic disease before death. Um, pretty staggering numbers with greater than 20,000 patients um, presenting annually with metastatic epidural spinal cord compression. Presentation varies. Um, pain is the most common. Um, neurologic symptoms are also um, at the forefront of the presenting symptoms. They can range from radiculopathy, myelopathy, or uh, cotaquina syndrome. And commonly, this is all associated with uh, pathologic fracture. The common pathologies um, that uh, metastasize to the spine are listed on the left. So we have breast cancer, lung cancer, thyroid cancer, renal cell, prostate, and then less commonly tumors of the GI system and the genitourinary system. Multiple myeloma and lymphoma technically are not metastatic disease, but um, in terms of treating them algorithmically, I think they fall into this uh, category, into the metastatic disease category. So ultimately, who needs surgery? Um, this is a decision that comes up very commonly, and it's probably the one that's the most challenging. And I won't run through um, a long list of uh, articles. Um, I'll try to, I've tried to synthesize what I've read in the literature to make it more digestible um, for those who will be taking care of these patients as well as those who um, uh, have any interest in it. So I'd like to turn this to big three. So when I see a patient with uh, spinal metastases, I go through each of these categories to determine whether they're, um, they're indicated for surgery. And making the decision is challenging. Um, it's very important because if you operate on someone who um, doesn't need it, then you can make them a lot worse and they're already starting off in a very compromised state. The first is determining whether they have any spinal st uh, instability. The second is to determine if they have any neurologic symptoms or what the degree of uh, epidural spinal cord compression is. And then this, um, and we combine this with the type of tumor that they have. And then the third is prognosis. So I'd like to run through how we um, evaluate each one of these. So in terms of just determining spinal stability, um, this is a, uh, the spinal instability neoplasm score. Um, you'll see that it has very similar uh, categories to the morale score that we use for uh, extremity tumors and determining stability. Um, you can see here that there's six categories, um, location, pain, the type of lesion, the uh, spinal alignment radiographically, the vertebral body collapse, and then the degree of posterior uh, lateral involvement. This all sums to a score, um, as you can see on the bottom right, with stable being zero to six, indeterminate having a sum score of seven to 12, and then unstable being 13 to 18. Um, if we look at the categories, they're somewhat intuitive. Um, location, areas that have more inherent um, motion to start. So the occip occipital cervical junction, the cervical thoracic junction, the junctions really, thoracolumbar as well as the lumbosacral get a higher score if the tumor um, is uh, compromised or is involved in those areas. Those areas that are rigid, say the um, thoracics or semi-rigid thoracic spine as well as the sacrum, get a low lower score. Pain, I think, is the one that I focus very heavily on. Um, this is mechanical pain and try to teach the residents and, and other trainees and fellows that um, one good way to assess mechanical pain is to ask someone if their pain essentially is resolved when they lie down, but is present and debilitating when they sit or stand, that's a very good sign that the spine um, is not able to withstand its own weight. And so that's a good sign of instability. And pain can come in a variety of flavors. It can just be back pain or can be a radiculopathy. So a patient who stands up and starts to have lateral chest wall pain or anterior abdominal pain from the thoracic lesion, but that's resolved when they lie down, that's a good sign that the spine um, is having some asymmetric collapse due to um, being unstable. Lytic lesions get higher score. Those that have um, subluxation or translation present on presentation clearly have a higher score. If the vertebral body, um, more than 50% of it's collapsed, that also gets a higher score. Um, and then if you have 
both of the posterior lateral elements, so both of the sets, pedicles, um, lamina involved, you also get a higher score. So after you determine whether someone's spine is stable or unstable, the next question is to ask, what is their neurologic symptoms? Um, what does the MRI show in terms of the degree of spinal cord compression and what type of tumor do they have? Now, this is a, a table that I've made and I think it captures a lot of our literature nicely. Um, we'll go through it, through it um, and also talks about some of the background behind um, how it was developed. But if you see here, on the uh, y, on the x-axis, we have the um, types of tumors relative to their relative radiosensitivity. So sensitive tumors are considered germ cell, multiple myeloma, lymphoma. Those that are considered intermediate radiosensitivity are breast and prostate cancer. And those that have relative uh, radio uh, resistant to uh, radiation are renal cell, non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, GI and some other GU tumors. Um, you then look at what on the y-axis, the degree of um, epidural uh, compression. Low-grade epidural spinal cord compressions where the uh, dura is being indented and the, the tumor abuts the, uh, the, tumor, uh, the spinal cord. Um, they have no associated myelopathy. Moderate epidural spinal cord compressions, you can see in the B, uh, the middle row there, is where the uh, tumor starts to abut and also deform the uh, spinal cord. And then those who have moderate to high grade epidural spinal cord compression commonly have associated myelopathy with it. Um, and this is where the spinal cord is uh, displaced and, and quite deformed. You can see here that irrespective of the degree of spinal cord compression, those that are sensitive tumors, germ cell, multiple lymphoma, you can treat these with radiation. Um, now, this is if the patient has no spinal instability. So if they have a stable spine, but they have high grade spinal cord compression and they have a sensitive tumor, the uh, recommendation is to do uh, radiation therapy. If you start to move into the intermediate and resistant uh, tumors in terms of radiation, uh, radiation is the first line of therapy for those who have uh, low grade epidural spinal cord compression. But once you start to get to the moderate and the high grade spinal cord compression, um, surgery followed by radiation is the uh, recommended algorithm. And the, the, the final point really comes from this seminal article that was uh, quite, a, quite a ways off now, uh, published in 2005 in Lancet by Patchell. And I think it's probably one of the studies that um, is discussed the most and it's important to talk, talk about its, its uh, findings. So this was a randomized multi-institutional trial of uh, 101 patients who underwent either surgery followed by radiation or radiation therapy alone. This is for tumors that were only radio, um, radio were resistant or um, had e intermediate resistance to radiation. So it did not include any of the sensitive uh, radiation uh, tumors. And the primary endpoint was the ability to walk. Uh, major findings were that patients treated with surgery retained the ability to walk significantly longer than did those with radiation therapy alone. You can see the median um, uh, in terms of days, 122 days versus 13 days, which is clinically and uh, statistically significant. Significantly more patients in the surgery group regained the ability to walk than those um, in the radiation group, 62% versus 20%. And because of these pretty uh, stark differences, the study was stopped early by the uh, Data uh, Safety Monitoring Board. Secondary endpoints, you can see here surgery um, was favored um, in, in, in terms of continence, um, Asia score, Frankel score, and survival time was statistically significant, about um, 30 days longer. Um, also important to note is that patients treated first with radiation therapy who then crossed over to the surgical treatment arm had inferior clinical outcomes. Um, thus, surgery is considered is best employed prior to radiation therapy. Um, there's several recent studies that also demonstrate that earlier presentation to a spine surgeon um, improves clinical outcomes. Um, and so part of the teaching, uh, not only within the institution, but also in the community, um, visiting radiation oncologists, medical, medical oncologists, and primary care doctors is to um, is to really emphasize this point. Um, if you 
kick the can down the road and try some alternative treatments before surgery, a lot of those times those patients present uh, in a more uh, decompensated state and don't have as good outcomes. So their major finding um, in quotes from their study, de direct decompressive surgery plus post-operative radiation therapy is superior to treatment with radiotherapy alone for patients with spinal cord compression caused by metastatic cancer. So um, once you dis, uh, evaluate their spinal stability, um, take into account their neurologic symptoms and the type of tumor, um, then a third question comes up as well, what's their prognosis? And uh, this is a table that gives some rough estimates um, in terms of me mean survival in patients treated with metastatic spine tumors. Thyroid has the highest lung cancer, you can see as pretty guarded uh, prognosis. Note that there is high variation between patients with the same type of tumor. And I think with some of the new immunotherapies, these numbers may change, but um, long-term data on that is still pending. Um, trying to determine the prognosis for patients is very challenging um, when there's multiple scoring systems as there are for this. As you can see on the right, the Karnowski, Tomita, Tokahashi, modified Bauer, um, New England spinal metastasis scores. That usually means that there's not one that really um, um, helps guide us very accurately. But in general, I think people who have a poor prognosis where you really have to determine whether surgery is uh, indicated or not are those who have diffuse spinal mets, um, including visceral mets. They present with a neurologic deficit, very, very poor nutrition, albumin less than three and a half. They have lung cancer. They have poor baseline function. Um, to start with, and then also if there's metastatic disease that's spread intradural, leptomeningeal disease, um, these are all very, very poor prognostic uh, indicators. General rule of thumb is that if a patient has less than three months to live, radiation therapy, uh, palliative radiation with no surgery is the way to go. This is a very hard decision to make, um, and turning down someone who presents with neurologic deficit uh, or telling them you're not going to do surgery if they have a new neurologic deficit or spinal instability is challenging. But again, intervening with these patients um, when they don't have good systemic control or they've had recent radiation, um, et cetera, you can put them at a lot, a lot more harm than, than help. So sometimes um, this is the way to go. The intermediate stage of survival, three to six months, Operative indication is indicated with a more limited surgical um, invasiveness, uh, decompression followed by radiation. And then those who have greater than six months to live, getting um, ventral and dorsal decompression with a corpectomy followed by radiation as per patchel is, um, is indicated. So the real question is what type of surgery do you do after you determine that they need it to determine, determine which one you're going to, to uh, perform. I break this up into four different categories. One from on the left, the least invasive to the right, which is the most invasive. So stabilization only um, really is indicated for mechanical instability. I'll show you an example of that uh, shortly. Um, this can be done percutaneously or open. Um, I'll show you a nice example of where you try to want to accomplish the goal of stability, but minimizing the morbidity of a surgical um, surgical approach. Posterior decompression alone, stabilization only. Again, this is for patients who have that intermediate lifespan, three to six months. Good for posteriorly based METs, even if they have long term, uh, longer life expectancy. Um, those who have a ventral MET um, with associated mechanical instability, predominant uh, with no or minimal ventral neural compression. They preserve sagittal alignment, um, so no real kyphosis. They've had prior radiation to this ventral MET. Um, and again, limited life expectancy, three to six months, this intermediate uh, invasiveness seems to be appropriate. For those who have longer life expectancy, greater than six months, um, corpectomy or now separation surgery um, is um, the mainstay of treatment. So this is good for ventral mets with core compression, associated kyphosis, radio resistant tumors with no prior radiation, and then prior radiation um, to the tumor with uh, enlargement of the tumor. I don't have a lot of experience with separation surgery. This is more of a minimally invasive um, operation where you you, uh, you go in, you create a couple millimeters of space between the spinal cord and the tumor, and then you rely on post-operative uh, SBRT to um, prevent progression of the disease, 
or um, or uh, decrease the uh, size of the, of the tumor. Uh, I'm a little hesitant with this approach because I have seen tumors progress after this. So I think if you're in there and you're doing an operation, you may as well take out as much as you can to um, op to guarantee or improve the chances of long-term dur durability of the surgery. So this is the first case I'd like to present. 67-year-old male presented with progressive left leg pain um, as well as severe back pain over one week. Um, it's now unable to sit up um, greater than 30 degrees in bed or walk to this back pain or leg pain. Um, less than 30 degrees in bed, he has no pain at all, none in the leg and none in the back. And because of this instability, um, he's been in bed for the last week. He has no urinary or bowel symptoms, uh, relatively healthy guy and neurologically he's intact. And uh, thanks to Jeff Berry for sending this patient my way. So these were his presenting images. On the left, we see x-rays um, in the middle CT and on the right MRI. You can see he is a very large osseolytic lesion of the sacrum, S1, S2, S3, um, both ventrally and dorsally. Um, and then he also has a underlying isthmic uh, spondy at L5S1. If we uh, biopsy demonstrate this was multiple myeloma. So if we look at you know, the thought process behind how to treat someone like this, um, go through the big three. First thing is determining stability. So this falls into the rigid category. So location-wise, he did a score of zero, but based on his clinical symptoms, he's very, very concerning for instability because of the inability to sit up more than 30 degrees without pain or even stand. So this would fall into the yes category of mechanical instability. He's got a lytic lesion. He has no, his relatively normal alignment. Um, he doesn't really have any collapse, but you can see that the vast majority of the sacrum is involved and then he has bilateral posterior lateral involvement. So like most of these, they fall in the intermediate category, which somewhat limits um, the utility of this scoring system. But anyways, um, again, mechanical instability is the most concerning. If we look at the neurologic symptoms, type of tumor table, he would fall into this category of sensitive tumor with uh, high grade spinal cord or uh, neural compression. He's neurologically intact, uh, but even if he wasn't, you could consider starting with radiation. But because he's unstable, uh, the thought was that we wanted to intervene surgically first, followed by postoperative radiation. But there's a debate of what, what's the best approach here. In terms of the invasiveness, so again, if we look at our uh, spectrum of invasiveness, this for him, the major problem was instability was not neural. Um, and so we planned on just doing stabilization only. When it comes to the sacrum, open um, lumbopelvic fixation is very, uh, it's a big incision, it's relatively morbid. If you're gonna rely on postoperative radiation to treat this, it'd be nice to minimize the um, incision size um, so that you don't risk it to hissing and getting infected. And so for him, we decided to do uh, uh, anterior L4 to S1 ALIF because we decided to do percutaneous um, uh, fixation uh, posteriorly. So we weren't gonna get any uh, bone grafting or fusion posteriorly. So L4 to the ilium, uh, because of the degree of sacral compromise, we placed bilateral iliac screws. Um, and this was all through these uh, very small uh, couple centimeter incisions um, that healed up nicely as you can see, and then had post-operative radiation. Um, day after surgery, day of surgery, he was able to get up and walk um, because of that me mechanical instability was treated. These are some of the happiest spine patients you could ever take care of. Um, this is a second case, 36 year old female to highlight some other um, parts of this algorithm. 36 year old female works here in the medical school administration, history of IG nephropathy, um, status post kidney transplant and chronic immunosuppression, newly diagnosed widely metastatic urothelial carcinoma uh, so a GU tumor is spread to distant lymph nodes. She's currently on chemotherapy and she presented with mid thoracic back pain, um, present at night, it was constant and really had no change with position. Uh, these were presenting radiographs, which were benign, which is also a good, um, you know, good example of patients who, who have history of tumor, but come up with negative x-rays definitely deserve um, more advanced imaging. This is her MRI, CT and PET CT. Um, MRI and CT were relatively normal. Increased, some increased signal in the vestibular bodies on the MRI, 
but her PET CT lights up like a Christmas tree in the upper thoracic spine. If we go through her scoring systems, she had a, a lesion in the semi-rigid area in the thoracic spine. She didn't have mechanical instability. She had a mixed lesion. She had normal alignment, no collapse, but more than 50% of the body was involved and only one side of the, uh, the uh, neural elements were involved. So she actually fell into the stable category. She planned on doing radiation and then also a cement augmentation. Um, in terms of neurologic symptoms and type of tumor, uh, this table, if we look, she has an intermediate, uh, or she has a resistant, radio-resistant tumor, um, also the GU, but she had very low grade epidural spinal cord compression, really had none. And so she fell into the radiation therapy and that's why we decided to do radiation therapy. However, she called the clinic a couple of weeks later before she had radiation and said, I have new back pain. Um, it's you know, present when I stand and sit, but it's really better when I lie down. Those patients always deserve uh, additional imaging. And you can see here presenting MRI on the left, the middle one, you can see that she has a new pathologic fracture. Um, the axial image shows that she has moderate epidural spinal cord compression. Um, and so moving through this, she now falls into the intermediate category, but because she's now fractured and has new ventral compression, clearly she's demonstrated instability. Um, in terms of this table, again, um, resistant tumor and now in the middle row, the moderate. So now she deserves surgical decompression stabilization followed by postoperative radiation. Looking at invasiveness, um, she's a very young woman who has good systemic options. Her life expectancy is greater than six months. Um, so she would fall into the category of deserving um, circumferential decompression um, with a corpectomy and uh, posterior instrument, instrumentation. And that's what we ended up doing for here. Um, did a one level VCR at T4 where she had a pathologic fracture. And then for uh, tumor patients getting um, several levels of fixation above and below um, is, is important. So T1 to T7. Uh, this was followed by radiation therapy um, once the incision healed and she's done uh, remarkably well. So in terms of reconstructive options, I um, wanted to walk through that kind of what has been done in the past, but also some of the newer technology. So really, really big picture umbrella. Um, we talk about anterior column reconstruction, um, the type of structural support. We'll talk about the materials you can use, modularity involved in those materials. Posterior column reconstruction, uh, the screws and rods. Um, you know, it seems simplistic, but there is some new technology out there that I think is important for everyone to be aware of. I think it holds a lot of promise. Um, in terms of the anterior column reconstruction, you can use a cage or you don't have to use a cage. Um, when you don't use a cage, the two options are PMMA cement and a structural osseous uh, graft. Um, the PMMA is a really nice technique I learned in fellowship from Jacob Buchowski. Um, something that can be utilized, um, it's very uh, cheap. And if you don't have any other uh, materials, this is something that's very doable. So the way this is done is once you do the corpectomy, you're doing it from the back, you insert a K wire through the caudal and cranial uh, vertebral bodies, and then you inject uh, the cement uh, around into the vertebral body from the back. Um, you wait until it hardens. You have to make sure that you don't put too much in because it can spread posteriorly and burn the cord, um, but it works very, very well. Osseous grafts, you know, um, usually um, large um, femoral grafts. The challenge with these is that you're going to place them from a posterior approach. Um, trying to size them appropriately can be challenging, but again, it's an option that you should be aware of. And then when you look at cages, um, in terms of material, you can use a radiolucent cage, so peak cage, um, as well as a metallic cage, as you see on the right. Modularity of cages, this is an evolution of the surgical technique. Um, static cages were the mainstay and really are very, um, very friendly. Um, challenge with them, again, because they're static, you have to get the size just right. And doing that from a posterior approach uh, or even the anterior approach can be, can be tough. Um, so expandable cages have really um, gained a lot of favor. Um, and these come in a variety of, of designs as well. They can have circular end plates, as you see in the upper right corner, as well as rectangular end plates. 
Um, even in this cadaveric specimen, you can see that <clears throat> the benefit of using a rectangular end plate is because it um, spans the entire apotheosial ring, the entire end plate. It has lower rates of subsidence. Um, in the upper right, the circular cage, you can already see that the end plate is being compromised by, by the cage. So the rectangular end plates people favor, or some people advocate for, they are more challenged in place from a posterior approach, involves quite a bit more um, uh, you know, room um, that you have to, to make when you're doing a corpectomy, but um, they may hold some long-term benefits. In terms of posterior column stabilizations, pedicle screws, um, metallic and radiolucent, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, you can place them open, um, usually indicated when neural decompression is, is needed. And then percutaneous, uh, as I showed earlier, is only when stabilization is needed. Rods also you can plate to metallic, either titanium and coal chrome, and then radiolucent uh, carbon fiber peak rods, which I'll talk about very shortly. Number of rods, um, two is the minimum, um, but multi-rod constructs with three or four, um, I've, I've taken favor to because these patients really never heal due to the radiation that they're gonna get post-operatively or they had had uh, pre-operatively. And so putting more rods in there seems to um, increase the longevity of these. So I think next step is to talk about some of this newer technology, which I'm excited about. And I do think holds a lot of promise. Um, so these are radiolucent uh, pedicle screws made from carbon fiber. There's two companies that make them, uh, Icotec and Carbofix. Um, this is the Icotec screw. Uh, you can see here, um, the entire shaft of the screw is radiolucent. It has a little titanium tip to it. And then the tulip heads are titanium. In terms of imaging, at least on a CT scan, you can see really the differences between scatter between this carbon fiber screw and the traditional titanium screws. The uh, alternative are these screws from Carbofix. Um, the only difference here is that the tulips are um, carbon fiber. There has a, a shell of titanium around the shaft, and so you can see them a little bit better within the bone. This doesn't really compromise um, any imaging. The, um, these, I think, are very beneficial if you have a posteriorly based tumor, um, you need to monitor for recurrence. Um, but if you have a ventral tumor, the, it's been shown um, that titanium posteriorly, either the tulip head or the rod, doesn't make a, a huge uh, difference in terms of post-operative imaging quality. There are newer studies, and I think more will come about these uh, about these screws and rods. Um, this is a study from from Germany that looked at 35 patients with spinal tumors. The majority of them were metastases, but there was other uh, pathologies involved, and they looked at the imaging quality compared to titanium uh, implants. And they found that these carbon fiber reinforced peak pedicle screws reduce image artifacts on CT and MRI. Um, they state that they, they hold value and they're a feasible option for spinal instruments in patients harboring spinal tumors um, when post-operative imaging radiation th therapy are necessary. Biomechanical studies have demonstrated them to be as robust as uh, titanium screws, at least um, in the short term. Long-term uh, integrity and is still TBD, um, but clinically we've had, we have not had any issues um, up to a year or two after surgery so far. So I wanted to give you an example of the patient. So this is a lady mid 60s with metastatic breast cancer who had um, a VCR at T8. You can see here what the, the screws look like on X-ray. Um, and, and with a radiolucent cage, you really get nice post-operative imaging. So this is post-operative MRI at the level of the screw. I direct your attention to the axial image on the right. Um, this is a post-operative MRI, and you can see the spinal cord and the uh, uh, spinal fluid really, really clearly. This is not the case if you look at a, a level where there's titanium uh, screws. We also look at the cage level. Um, this is also with a radiolucent cage. Again, very, very clear post-operative, um, uh, very, very clear imaging after surgery. Uh, this is another example of patient uh, metastatic renal cell at L1. Um, he had both ventral pathology at L1, but he also had tumor 
at uh, L2 in the spinous process. And this is an example of the all radiolucent screws um, at several of the levels. You can see the corpectomy at L1 with the radiolucent cage, and then the radiolucent screws with the radiolucent tulips um, spanning above and below those levels, um, as well as a couple levels above. Um, the titanium here um, is to create a multi rod construct. So you have also radiolucent rods um, that you can't see. Um, and if we look at post operative MRIs, it's as clear as if there wasn't really any instrumentation uh, present. This is at the screw level, and then this is at the level of the, at the level of the cage. So my practice, really in evolution, I do think that this technology holds um, some benefit. And so, just in terms of kind of where I started um, several years ago, this is a case uh, first or second year of practice, generation one. Um, implants, T7 diacellular carcinoma, also a T4 dorsal base lesion presented with a neurologic compromise. So we did um, dorsal decompression at T4 as well as a VCR at T7 um, and then all metallic construct with a cage um, that's titanium as well as screws that are, that are metallic. Generation two um, was looking at uh, just using a radiolucent cage ventrally. This is before I started using the uh, carbon fiber screws and rods and everything posteriorly um, was titanium. This is a 70 year old lady with metastatic lung cancer. We did a two level VCR. Um, this is the patient I showed earlier with the metastatic breast cancer at T8. Um, in addition to the radiolucent cage anteriorly, we then started using these uh, carbon fiber screws um, because of their cost, we tried to create a hybrid construct where we placed the radiolucent screws just above and below the area of the tumor, um, because that's really the area of focus when it comes to uh, radiation as well as post-operative imaging. Um, and that's what we did here. And then the fourth generation of um, instrumentation was essentially combining the screws that are radiolucent with rods that are radiolucent um, with uh, the ventral, um, the uh, radiolucent cage. So you can see here two level um, metastatic thyroid cancer. So it's not unblocked, this is just two level um, debulking. And then we did the one level above, one level below with the radiolucent screws and then also uh, forayed into the radiolucent rods posteriorly. You can see here just on the x-rays um, it's as clear as day. Um, you can really see that uh, VCR site very, very clearly with no overlying um, uh, overlying rods. And then this is the case I showed earlier, fifth generation. We've gone into uh, ventral uh, radiolucent cage, uh, screws that are radiolucent above and below, and then the screws have the radiolucent uh, tulips and um, really create a construct that's completely radiolucent. Um, I think there's a lot of promise to this. Um, not only does it improve rate uh, imaging postoperatively, but we're coordinating or collaborating with radiation oncology right now, Steve Bronstein in particular. We've um, collected all, all of our patients and are looking at whether this technology alters the dose of radiation that can be uh, administered. And preliminary data, so I don't have any for this talk, but. Um, the preliminary data shows that it does change um, and allows better um, allows better um, planning for radiation. And we're really one of the centers, one of the handful of centers in the United States who is uh, evaluating this and using this. We are the thought leaders. And just recently, um, we've been invited to talk at the 12th annual multimodal treatment of spine tumors uh, session to the Seattle Science Foundation in about a month. Uh, me and Dr. Bronstein will be talking on dosimetric impact of material choice and dosimetry and radiation therapy. And um, I think um, if you guys want to log in and, and join, I'd be happy to have you. So I think this is very promising technology, but we definitely have more to learn. So in conclusion, metastatic spine disease is exceedingly common. The decision to operate is not black and white. Um, the big three, if you will, can be a good guide. Um, this includes assessing spinal stability, 
um, determining what their neurologic symptoms or the degree of spinal cord compression is in combination with the tumor type. And then prognosis is important. Um, Evolving reconstructive and stabilization options are exciting. These involve carbon fiber reinforced peak that are already loosened. And I think one thing I really want to highlight is that outcomes are very dependent on careful and well coordinated multidisciplinary care, not only radiation oncology, medical oncology, um, but also intraoperative uh, teams. It's very important that people um, are aware that these are challenging cases with, uh, with a lot of risk. And so having people who are all on the same page when it comes to taking care of them um, and optimizing their outcome and improving it is very important. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak and uh, look forward to taking any questions. Well, that was a terrific presentation and thanks for sharing your, your uh, growing and evolving experience with managing these really difficult uh, tumors affecting the spine. Congratulations as well um, um, the, on, on your growing audience uh, with regard to, I remember when we first set up the, the Zoom uh, visit where we had a, a couple people, then we did another one with a couple hundred, and, and now doing an in-person visit with the group up in Seattle and uh, also at the Academy. I think you'll have a presence as well as uh, uh, at, at Mass this year. So congratulations on that. You know, you indicated at the end in your conclusion that management of, spinal, of tumors affecting the spine really requires multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary care. What are we doing well with that now uh, at UCSF? Maybe this is a question that our, our tumor group can be involved in as well. And, and what can we do better? How can we do a better job of integrating care between specialties and improving some of the deficiencies we talked about in the first hour? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, so again, it's a nice uh, transition from the last session. Um, I think what one thing that we do really well is we have a team that meets every week. It is the sarcoma tumor board, but patients who take care of tumors in general. So it's a defined team that meets regularly. And that creates an environment in which discussion is very uh, free. And, um, and people are also really on the same page when it comes to managing the patients. They have the patient's well-being uh, at the forefront. And if you have good communication and you communicate um, in a timely fashion, I think that's something that really, really helps with improving these patients' uh, outcomes. When it comes to what we could do better, I do think that there is an opportunity to engage the community in a better way. And um, that's through uh, education of our, in outreach sites, um, visiting primary care doctors, mm -hmm. Um, radiation therapists, medical oncologists, um, and really sitting down and talking about what uh, what uh, services we offer, but also highlighting the importance of being available. And I give my cell phone number to every single person I meet, and being really available. You know, on a Sunday when they call you at 6 a.m. and say we have a patient who's pregnant in Washington Hospital, and she has a new diagnosis of metastatic cancer. Um, you have to be willing to take care of those patients. You can't pick and choose when you want to do it. So um, I think that's a thing that we, we do a good job of currently um, in, a, in a sense, but I think we can, um, we can reach further. And I think we can capture people in different states, different uh, regions within California, because uh, I do think this is a center that provides outstanding care of these patients. Right, and other, so I see a hand up from Dr. Westrack. Alexos, thank you, that was a great talk. Um, I've noticed that some of the um, histologies that commonly go to bone have changed quite a bit with newer treatments. And my um, decision to operate has changed based on that. And the, the prime example is lung. You know, so when you have lung cancer, some really respond to the newer treatments like to Grisso, for example. So how does that play into your decision when to operate and what type of construct to use? Let's say you have, you know, the classic example is a middle-aged woman with no smoking history and a new diagnosis of, you know, an EGFR positive uh, metastatic lung cancer. So expecting that there might be a good response, do you hold off on surgery or do you do maybe a smaller surgery than the imaging and exam would dictate? 
based on that? Yeah, great question. I do think that the types of uh, medical management, immunotherapies, et cetera, mm -hmm. are changing the, um, the approach. Um, and really, I think the life expectancy of a lot of these patients will increase. So I think it depends on what they present with. If the patient presents with a new diagnosis, but they have uh, instability, I would treat them surgically and then followed by radiation and medical management. Mm -hmm. um, if they present with high grade spinal cord compression and no instability, I do think that radiation uh, therapies in is a good option. Um, but I think that getting, if they, if I think that they're going to have a relatively long life expectancy and their options medically are uh, favorable, then I do favor, you know, more upfront. I think getting a circumferential decompression um, to give them the best chance of you know, taking as much off that area and protecting the cord long-term as possible would be my approach. So I, um, I do try to, I think my surgical approach is to give them the best chance of maintaining their neurologic function and then relying heavily on uh, the adjuvant uh, treatments afterwards. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hey, Dr. Pilogos, um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. That's a great talk, thanks. Uh, so I, I'll follow up with Dr. Uh, Westrick's question. So, so let's see a patient who has, uh, who's neuro intact and they have like on imaging, they sort of have a, some sort of a collapse. Do you see a role for perking like percutaneous, those patients uh, versus doing a, a full corpectomy? Because you know, those patients, when, when you do big surgery on them, we have to delay their uh, radiation which could potentially, uh, or, or chemotherapy or other modalities of treatment, which could, you know, make the primary spread more. So is there a role for just perking those patients, provided they don't have a neurologic problem and relying on radiation, uh, since they, we don't expect them to heal in terms of bone healing anyway. So what do you yeah. think of that scenario? Yeah, that's a great, great question, Ali. You have to take it, um, patient by patient, but I do think that there is a role for minimally invasive stabilization in those patients who have symptoms of instability, but no um, neurologic symptoms and no real high grade spinal cord compression. You know, just an example of a, where this came up recently is a, that pregnant woman, 32 year old metastatic breast cancer had three levels of pathology, was neurologically intact. Um, but had um, instability at, uh, had instability. And so we didn't do PERC, but we just stabilized her and we're relying on um, radiation therapy postoperatively to minimize you know, a, a significant operation in a woman who's uh, in her first uh, early second trimester. So yeah, you have to tailor your surgical approach based on not only the, uh, the spine, but also everything, every other medical situation that that is present. Because generally, we would expect the uh, the tumor to shrink after radiation. I mean, provided they're neuro intact, even if they do have some uh, tumor mass in the front, mm -hmm. uh, they, that would shrink down if we just provide perks. So I think, yeah, that, that, that helps. Thank you. Yeah, and it, yeah, radiation therapy, especially the SBRT, is very powerful. Um, even the quote unquote radio resistant tumors tend to respond well to it now, um, but they can't give it. Um, safely if there is not enough space um, between the tumor and the spinal cord. So you have to oh. talk to radiation oncologists beforehand. And that's so if the tumor itself is sort of abutting the fecal sac too much, they may not be able to do much radiation. Correct. So that's where separation uh, surgery comes in. Yeah. Okay. And at yeah. any point, do we expect fusion? Uh, down the line, even if they have a good survival, or it just stays as, I mean, given the radiation and stuff, is it just uh, so, sort of uh, the construct taking all the weight till forever, or at any point are we expecting any bone infusion in that area? Yeah, I don't, th with radiation, they're going to get it. I don't think that you can expect fusion. Um, there's recent studies showing that if you, even if up to a year or two, um, you know, even though they don't heal, there's not um, any compromise of the, the constructs. But I do think that, you know, wrapping this all together is that patients are going to live longer. 
the stability of the constructs are going to become potentially more important. Um, and so I think time will tell in terms of the durability of these operations for some of the newer uh, medical treatments. And that's why adding multiple rods could give them a little more time until they fail, if they're going to fail. Oh, thanks so much. It's a great talk. Thanks. Lycos, how do you manage the situation where the patient got radiation um, and then the tumor progressed and now is a surgical candidate? Um, I've just encountered that then you make the incision, but the incision may not heal infection and stuff like that. So how do you approach that situation? Yeah, that, that's challenging. Um, if the patient gets radiation and then they progress within a week, um, now they present with a new neurologic deficit. That's a very, very difficult situation. And probably that wasn't a good idea to start with to do radiation. Probably, that patient probably should have had surgery first followed by radiation. But um, if a patient's had radiation, I try to wait at least a week between uh, surgery and um, the radiation. There's a study from Mass General in the 80s um, that demonstrated that if you do surgery within a week of radiation, the wound complication rate is about 70%, whereas if you do it after a week, it's about 20 or 30, so it's still high. Um, but if you can delay surgery for at least a week after radiation, that's that's ideal, but sometimes it's not, it's not possible. But that's, I think, where the multidisciplinary team approach is really key, is the radiation oncologists in, in an institution should be talking to the surgeons, say, hey, I have this patient, what do you think? Um, do you think radi you should do radiation first, go to surgery? And that's where the decision is made together. Um, and, uh, but a lot of times people work in silos and if you don't have that communication, that's where these, uh, you, know, you may not be treating the patient in the best way. Lekos, how's that thinking changing with confocal uh, radiation beam? So confocal beam as well as uh, uh, stereotactic radiation. Yeah, I think that there are, it's very powerful. I think there's more tumors, metastatic tumors that can be treated by SBRT um, effectively than in the past. So I think there is a, a growing role for it. Um, I do think that there is a discussion still that needs to be had between the radiation oncologists and um, surgeons. I know that when I operate on a patient or before I do, I contact one of the radiation oncologists and ask them, is this a patient who's a candidate for SBRT? Um, and if they are, then I may do less surgically um, because that can minimize the invasiveness of the operation, especially if they're old, they're, you know, their platelets are low, um, they're pregnant. So um, if we can do something less when radiation can't accomplish what surgery would, then I think that's, um, that's a win for everybody. Because we have an audience today that includes some surgeons from uh, Seattle, Dr. Chapman, as well as from Connecticut, Dr. Eisler. And they both uh, brought up the question about um, just, uh, informed choice and patient choice. And uh, uh, what experiences have you had with, uh, with patient informed decision making? What kind of resources do we have? And, and I think you know, recently we talked about a, ca a case where uh, patient informed choice or, or where patient choice might have been a little bit different than what you recommended. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience with informing patients and uh, how patients are involved in their own care? Yeah, uh, those are great questions. And yes, the patient is actively involved in the decisions um, here. Um, and uh, I think their decisions are also guided by a lot of input from the different subspecialties. So they get input from myself, from uh, a lot of times, you know, ortho-oncologists like uh, Rosie or uh, Melissa as well as a radiation oncologist. So I think their decisions are also informed by a lot of different um, information. So a good example of where patient's um, choice dictated the ultimate treatment, uh, was involved in the treatment was this pregnant woman where we thought that she needed um, more invasive operation. Um, we wanted to do an angiogram and embolization of the tumor as well as um, a fiducial marker preoperatively. She was very insistent on uh, minimizing the amount of radiation, which was completely understandable. And so um, because we couldn't do some of the other modalities or uh, optimization, um, 
uh, treatments that we wanted to before surgery, we ended up electing to do a smaller operation and relying more heavily on post-operative radiation. Um, and we're also now doing the radiation SBRT kind of in a different manner because we don't want her to progress with her pregnancy and then do radiation in a couple of weeks. So we're doing SBRT, but just lateral, lateral based uh, beams that's going to spare the posterior incision um, so that we can do it as early in her pregnancy as possible to minimize the effect on the, uh, the growing uterus and fetus. So yeah, it's very important. Um, but I do find that a lot of tumor patients, they end up, if you describe to them why you're doing what you're doing, um, then they are willing to, a lot of times, willing to go through with it. I think management of tumors is very much in the realm of discretionary medicine. And anytime we see high degrees of variability, we need more evidence to guide care. And fundamentally, that's what empowers informed decision making, isn't it? It's the level of evidence we have. And for many of these cases, we don't have great evidence. That's correct. Hey, Dr. Theologist, this is Sam. Do you mind if I ask a question? <clears throat> Regarding getting the carbon fiber implantation into the hospital with the, having a higher cost, how did you convince the hospital-based system to pay for it? Because there is a lot of resistance that I'm coming across uh, in some of the institutions I have heard and even where I am going. In terms of convincing it, well, you know, these are good for the tumor patient. It's going to help. But in reality, the institution just because the dollar amount that they have to pay. So do you, I don't know, do you have any feedback? Do you have any, you know, help advices with that uh, aspect? Yeah. So the cost of the implant is high. Um, it's $4,000 per screw, which is pretty astronomical. But if you focus just on that, then or the hospital just focus on that, they're gonna get scared and they're gonna, they're probably not going to, um, they're not going to want to approve it. Now that's a, that's a naive approach on their part. And the reason for that is because when you look at um, a deeper dive into the economics and the reimbursement that comes from insurance companies, the patients who are treated with these implants, a lot of times the hospitals make money. And so I presented to the, um, the, the committee at UCSF and they've actually encouraged us to use it um, because when the patients who are not Medicare, private insurance, there's a carve out with, the, with uh, the reimbursement from the insurance companies for the implants. And so they end up, UCSF ends up making money uh, and most hospitals will if these implants are using non-Medicare patients and the, taking all comers, um, including the Medicare, there's, it's also a, a plus. So um, it, it does require more than just looking at what the cost of the screws is, it's what's the ultimate um, you know, economic analysis. And uh, there are some thoughts now that this um, technology, because it will change the and allow higher doses of radiation safely um, it could decrease the recurrence rate mm -hmm. there's a recent um, preliminary data from um, from Sloan and not Sloan Kettering um, in, in Texas that demonstrates a lower recurrence rate and so if you have a lower recurrence rate you may be ultimately saving on you know uh, revision operations so this does have uh, far-reaching uh, implications and just what the upfront cost is of the screws. Because like, we're just about out of time, th this discussion is a whole nother grand rounds because uh, there, there's some major problems with new technologies and the need to demonstrate an incremental value is critical. And I applaud you for the work that you're doing and trying to demonstrate some incremental value on this. As you know, and as a, a, a committee member for the HTAP committee here, uh, there's some real problems with uh, the expense of this technology and in the absence of actually showing a benefit, we're not going to be able to use this in a sustainable way. And that's why it's so incumbent upon us, again, as stewards of our healthcare economy, to make sure we demonstrate a benefit. And, and that really still remains to be shown. Well, with that, uh, Drew, any, any final closing remarks? I think it's uh, beyond 830. Yeah, I think uh, we'll wrap up there. But um, Dr. Theolo, just thank you so much again for Grand Rounds today. That was excellent. And um, we'll see you all next week for Dr. Tiffany Liu. Ooh. 
Well, thanks, everybody. Great job, Alekos. See you in a few minutes.